talking about God's love, and we started off with a question that's probably the question that seems the easiest, but really the most disturbing. Who does God love? Um, and it's disturbing when you get down to one element of it. At, at one level, it's not disturbing. God loves the world. You know, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And the Bible goes on to talk about the kind of people in the world that God loves. He loves the powerless. When we were powerless, God sent his son. And what it says in Romans chapter 5 is when we were powerless, ungodly, and sinners, that's when God demonstrated his love to us in sending his son to die. God didn't love us when we were doing it well and saying it right. He didn't love us when we were doing all the things. He, he loved us when we were powerless, when we were unable to turn intention into action. He said, do this. We were unable to do that. And he loved us at that point. He loved us when we were ungodly. And when we were not, because we were powerless, the things that we were saying and the things we say and do are not in line with what he would like us to say and do. Sinners. And who does God love? He loves the world, full of powerless, ungodly sinners. And there's good news. That means that God loves us. God loves us, unless you're not one of those people. Unless you're not part of the world, you're not powerless, you're not ungodly, you're not a sinner. But we all are. The, the challenge is he also loves them. He doesn't just love us, he loves them. That f facet of the world that we feel distant from, don't love. God loves them. He loves the thems. And that's who does God love. And we'll remind ourselves of that from week to week. The next question is interesting. What is God's love like? We'll start and describe it a little bit. We're going to spend the next six weeks looking at the love of God. And the reason why is because in order to make progress spiritually, the love of God must be the fuel. Um, we'll answer, again, some basic questions. And the reason why we need to is that the clearer our perception is of God's love and the clearer our ability to apply it to our life, the more spiritual progress we can make. So consider where you are spiritually. You're farther along than you were. You're not where you'd like to be. Think about the way you treat others. Think of the way you relate to yourself. Think of the way you relate to God. Um, think of where you are and where you'd like to be. The way you treat other people things you do to other people that you wish you didn't do. The things you struggle with, you really wish you wouldn't struggle with. And you think about, what would it be like if I could go from here to here? And not maybe do all the things that I do over here. The path from here to there, no matter what your here is and what your there is, God's love is that which will enable you to make progress and go that way. Understanding it and applying it, that's the fuel. And that's why it's important for us to, to consider and we'll look at what God's love is like. We're going to say a couple things about God's love. One thing is that it's realistic. And we're going to say that it's real. It's based on that because if you scan back in time, this is kind of weird, think of the universe. And this is one of those things, before I, get, before I go too far, it's, it's one of those things your brain's going to start going, boop, you know, you used to have with the test patterns in TVs. Like if you, if you fall asleep in front of the TV, it doesn't do that anymore, I don't think. But there used to be test patterns. And so, you know, you fall asleep and, and then you, you wake up and then the TV is doing, boop. How many of us remember that? How many of us have no idea what I'm saying? There it is. You're probably younger. There you go. There you go. Um, you know what I hate? I, I have absolutely no idea why I was saying that now. Why was I bringing up test patterns and... Um, oh, yeah, I, I remember. I, I got it. I'm good. I'm good now. I'm good. Um, okay. <laughs> okay, think about the universe, okay? Planets, stars. We're back in the universe. Planets, stars. Okay. Take away the planets. Take them away. Universe without planets. Take away the stars. Let's focus in on the earth now. 
Get rid of the atmosphere. Get rid of the people. Get rid of the creatures on the earth. Get rid of the water. Get rid of the land. We're erasing things. And now everything seems to be erased. And at one time, that's what everything was like. And who exists? God exists. Where did he come from? He's always been there. And the thing that's always been true of God, if you put your finger on the pulse of what you have, God is love. Love existed before the world did. It existed before stars. It existed before anything, because that's what characterizes God. I don't get that, the fact that God's always been here. That's one of those things that now you understand why I brought up the test pattern. I try to think of that, and I try to think of God always existing, and that's what it does in my head. Boom! You know, it just kind of turns off. It's hard to hear, but, but I probably did enough with that, didn't I? I'd, you probably don't want to hear that noise again. I, I, I'd be safe to say I don't have to make that noise again, and you'd be fine with me. Okay. Uh, how about that one? No, I'm just, um, God's love is real. It's real. It expresses itself in things that he does. We'll look at those things over the course of the next couple of weeks. Um, it's realistic. It's realistic. Um, what it says, this is a quote by, I, I, I don't, there's some Christian books, I, I, I didn't really, I wasn't crazy about this book, but it had one quote that I've always remembered, and I committed it to memory because of all the quotes and all the books. This is one of the ones that has been the most impactful. I've thought about this by J.I. Packer in, in uh, Knowing God. He says, God's love to me is utterly realistic, and it's written in here, based at every point on prior knowledge of the worst about me, so that no discovery now can disillusion him about me in the way I am so often disillusioned about myself and quench his determination to bless me. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do. You got that? You got that in the worship? You got that thing? Read that again. Read that to yourself. Go ahead. You know what that means? God can never be disillusioned with you because he's never illusioned with you to begin with. God can never be disillusioned with you. See, when somebody says, I'm surprised at you, um, the reason why they say I'm surprised at you or I'm disappointed with you is, is because they didn't expect something to come. And, and they're said, those sentiments um, are based in ignorance. God knows you and sees you, and he can never be disillusioned with you because he's never illusioned with you in the first place. He knows you completely and sees you thoroughly. Look what it says in Psalm 139. It says specifically what God knows and sees. Psalm 139 verse 1 says, O Lord, you have searched me and know, you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, O Lord. You hem me in behind and before you have laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty to attain. What does God know about you? He knows when you sit and when you rise. He knows your habits. Before you're about to do this thing that maybe no one else knows that you're about to do, God knows exactly what you're going to do. In that sense, God is like a shepherd, and you are one of his sheep. And he just doesn't understand all the sheep. He understands you. He calls you by name. And the reason why he knows you is that he looks at you and perceives why you do and what you're about to do. His love is realistic, and God loves you, and that love is in full awareness of what you're like. God can never, with respect to you, say, and I loved you when you're doing that, that's it. Because God initiated love toward you, fully understanding what you were like. That you were powerless, ungodly sinner, and that's when God sent his son for you. At that time, there's nothing you can do that causes God to withdraw his love. We imagine that there is, and that's our problem, isn't it? We imagine that God withdraws his love because we think God's like everyone else. I'm surprised at you. I'm disappointed with you. I'm disillusioned with you. 
God can never be like that. We ascribe human characteristics. Now, God is loving, and we know some things about love, but God invented love. And love existed before the world ever did. God didn't need to create the world. You know how he created the world at some level? He wants to share his love. Will everybody experience it? To a degree, everybody experiences it in this world. He reigns sunshines on the just and the unjust. It says not all will live with him to experience his love eternally. There's a belief that happens. So here's what God tells you to believe. It's the most important thing that you will ever believe in your life. Here's what he wants you to believe. I know you. And I see you. I understand why you do what you do. And I love you. And I'm committed to your welfare. And that's what he wants you to believe. He knows when you sit and when you rise. Not surprised by you. You know what else he knows? Look what it says. You know, when I sit and when I rise, you perceive my thoughts from afar. You know, God can read your mind. And he doesn't have to look real hard. He just can kind of go, oh, I see what you're thinking. I see what you're thinking. I see. Not everybody knows what you're thinking, but God says, I know what you're thinking. You know, sometimes we play games with God. We pretend. We talk with him and we say, Oh, God, thank you. And as he says, what are you thinking that? That's not what you're thinking. You're thinking, God, I'm disappointed. I, I thought you'd give me more things than you'd give me. I thought you'd take away these things. I thought I was going to be a better person once I started trying to understand you. And he wants us to be honest with him because he already sees. He, he understands our thoughts from afar. He says, you discern my going out, my lying down. You're familiar with all my ways. Before word is on my tongue, you know it completely. You know, sometimes... You hear somebody say, I knew you were going to say that. You always say that. God does. He knows your words before you speak them. So here's what he knows about you. He knows your habits. He knows your thoughts. And he knows your words. And in full awareness of those things, God has channeled his love toward you. You know what he wants you to do? He wants you to believe it. You say, God can't love me because I did. That didn't surprise him. He doesn't love me because I think that doesn't surprise. You understand what I'm saying? He's never disillusioned because he's not illusioned to begin with. God's love is in place or it's not. You know what it says in the Bible? God is not reactive. God's not reactive. It's hard for us not to be reactive with one another. You read it in our, we read it in one another's faces, don't we? When you do something disappointing to someone and you can read the look on their face because their face changed from I did this, to I did that, and we tried maybe to mask it. Some of us try, and it kind of a little twitch in our face that shows, I'm trying to be good, but I don't like what you just did. You know what? God's face never twitches. Never twitches. God is never reactive. His brow never, his brow never furrows. He never gets, God doesn't have lines right here. He, he, he doesn't do that. He's... You know what the Bible said? What do you, even, how do you know that? It says God is part of the new covenant. He will be helios to your transgressions. That's a Greek word, helios. It's translated, he'll forgive your transgressions. That's not what it says. That's you know one translation, the New International Version, but really what it says, God will be helios. Helios means good-natured, benevolent, cheerful, and gracious. Good-natured, benevolent, cheerful, gracious. Listen to me. God will be helios to your transgressions. Not only does he not react with, hmm, hmm, I didn't know you were going to do that. Hmm. I didn't know you were capable of saying that type of stuff. I didn't know you could think those type of thoughts. He can never be reactive to you. You do that thing and you look at him. I want you to believe I love you. Is he trying to be nice? No, what we'll see is that the love of God is the engine for spirituality. It's the engine. It's the fuel. It's what drives the motor. If it's going to be authentic, if it's going to be connection that leads to serving, it's got to be real. It's got to be love. It can't be fear. can't be. Um, God's love is realistic. He understands exactly what we're like. And loves us. It's not just realistic. This is a make-up word, but it kind of goes with real, relational. 
relational, relational. I guess what I'm saying, he really doesn't want something fake with you. He wants something real, and it can be real because that's what he sees with you. And he doesn't want a pretend carbon copy of who you are. He doesn't want a nice, pretty, shined up version of who you are. He wants you in your good and bad. He wants all of it. And if you think you're going to keep the bad and give him the good or take the good and give him the bad, he wants the whole pot. He wants everything because he loves you in your entirety because he knows you in entirety. It's relational. And relational in two ways. God's love is fatherly and kingly. And both. And these can be kind of confusing. It's God's love is fatherly. Fatherly. Look what it says in Galatians 4. God sent his son born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those under law that we might receive the full rights of son. Redeem means to deliver somebody out of slavery. We were under bondage to law. And when A person redeems another person. They take them out of a situation of slavery and move them into a system of freedom. It might be equated to emancipate, liberation. That's what it means to redeem. It says, because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out Abba Father. And it says, but the the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. What does salvation do? What does salvation do? What salvation does, according to this, he sent Jesus to redeem those under law that we might receive the full rights of sons. Here's what salvation's about. We relate to to God maybe as master to slave. We feel like slaves and he's the master. This is our default setting for God. And what salvation is, it's when God moves us from this place to a place where we relate to him as father to son or daughter. That's what salvation is. That's what Jesus accomplishes. He buys us out of slavery and enables us to be part of the family. And the difference between a slave and a son or daughter is that a son or daughter has a permanent place in God's family where a slave doesn't. You have to keep churning it out to be a slave. To be a son or daughter, you know, especially if you're Parents know you well. But with God, he knows you intimately. You're never not part of the family. How would it impact your relationship with him as father if you believe that? Sons and daughters have, and that's what he sent his son to do. That's why Jesus came. And because he wants to re- change the way we relate to God. The reason why God sent his son so that we would relate to him as a son or daughter to a father rather than a master to a slave. God sends his spirit into our heart. That's what happens next. He sends his son into the world to make something happen, and then he sends his spirit. Well, look what it says. Because you are sons and daughters, because you are sons and daughters, you know, the problem is we don't think like sons and daughters. And here's what God did about that. God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out Abba Father. The reason why God sends the spirit is to teach us how to relate to God as Father. Um, The nature of the spirit's influence, he tells us about our Father. He develops a child-father bond between God and us. I think the human spirit, we naturally relate to God fearfully. We don't need to try, it's just in the genes, I think. We relate to God fearfully. Our spirit does this. And sometimes our spirit acts all bragging, I'm way better than other people, but the reason why we do that is because we're insecure. People who are truly secure don't have to prove anything to anyone. Maybe we try to boast, and some of us feel very insecure, but the human spirit kind of does that. And the spirit testifies to our spirit. And he tries to get our spirit to Look at God differently. The Spirit is that part of us that relates to God, I believe. And you know what the Spirit of God says to your spirit? You know what I'm going to say. Some of you probably know what I'm going to say. Our spirit is kind of like the scarecrow, the cowardly lion, the tin man, cold, afraid, nervous, You know what the spirit comes to us as our spirit is metal or shaking, frightened? Shh. 
do you know God demonstrates his own love toward you and that while you were powerless, ungodly, and sinful, Christ died for you? Shh. He's your father. And as we learn to relate to God as father, his love settles into our heart. You know what happens when his love settles into our heart? We start to make progress spiritually. That's how it works. The love of God is the fuel. Um, it's the nature of the Spirit's influence. The critical interface in the Christian life is God's Spirit whispering to your spirit saying, be quiet. He knows you. He knows what's happening inside. He knows the conflict. He knows the thoughts. He knows the words. And his love is not, he's not reeling his love back in. Our spirits become afraid. And we try to force ourselves to do things that would make us feel more confident that we're loved. And you know what the spirit says? You don't have to change anything to be more loved. In fact, you know what happened? If you understood that you didn't have to change in order to be loved, it would change you. You understand what I just said? When you get to the place where you understand that you don't need to change in order for God to love you, that will change you. That will change you. And you'll start to change. You'll be able to get your hand off your spiritual pulse. It'll, you'll, you'll, it'll help you start being more selfish. Now, again, it doesn't cure it. <laughs> it, doesn't, it hasn't with me. But if, if you understand that you're cared for, it really does help you to love others. Helps you to breathe. Helps you to be not as controlling, not as manipulative, more secure. The Spirit testifies with our spirit that we're children of God. And this isn't just because the Spirit is nice. I've talked about this before. We know something about why children become healthy and why children develop the capacity to master skills, why they become empathetic, why a child becomes, has good self-esteem, develops self-control. We know why self-esteem, self-control, mastery, and empathy, why children develop that. And here's the deal. The child comes to have a mental representation of the parent as loving. The parent has been cooperative with the child, works with the child as they're young, becomes accepting of the child's need to be loved. Moms are so good at this. Dads tend to be a little more harsh, but a mother knows when a child is frightened and responds not to the anger or the crying, but to the thing that's underneath that. The, I want to be touched. Come here, baby. Come here. Shh. Sensitive. Moms and dads can do that. They can see it. They can see it in the child. They come in, see the face. What's wrong? What do you mean what's wrong? It, there's something wrong. Sensitive, available. Cooperative, accepting, sensitive, and available. When a child, now none of us are perfect. No parents are perfect. Not to the degree that those things are present. A child will sit in that security. Oh, and from that secure place, here's what the child will think. Relationships are good. It's good to be accepting and kind to people. It's good to be empathetic. They can not be so nervous that they can look at things, they can figure things out because they don't have to get their own back. They know they're looked at so that they can explore and learn about things. They, because the most important person in the world attends to them, they feel important. They have good self-esteem, not boastful, but they know they make a difference. They self-esteem, and, and you know what's interesting? Self-control comes from that too. A secure child who knows they're loved has a better ability not to get what they want now. Isn't that funny? Isn't that funny? All that comes from security. What does God do to change you? You know what I'm going to do? <laughs> Shh. I see you. I sympathize with you. I deal gently with you and I love you. I change you. I choose you. Good's ahead of you. Good's guaranteed. I give you the power to persevere. I give you the power to be content. What happens when you drink that in? Mastery, empathy, self-esteem, self-control. Well, you know what else? Another way you could put it? 
Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, fruit of the Spirit. You know what's funny about this thing? As I was reading this stuff, you know, this is psychology, and some of you don't, oh, okay, indulge me a little bit. You can't say no. Um, <laughs> so, so there's, there's empathy and self-control. What they say about attachment and psychology, empathy, self-control, and the fruit of the Spirit, the bookends of the fruit of the Spirit are love and self-control. Isn't that interesting? You'd almost think that God invented family, wouldn't you? Isn't that funny how that works out? It's almost like it was created to be that way. It's almost like God understands how a child is changed. It's, not, it's almost like he created us to flourish when we're secure. It's almost like that, isn't it? Because God created family. And our families aren't perfect. But God's love is geez, perfect. He knows you. As you drink that in, mastery, empathy, love, self-control. It's not just because the Spirit's nice. God's love is not just fatherly. It's also kingly. It's also kingly. Look what it says. In Isaiah 32, it looks forward to a time when Jesus the king will come, and this is what it says about his reign. See, a king will reign in righteousness, and rulers will rule with justice. Each man will be like a shelter from the wind and a refuge from the storm, like streams of water in the desert and the shadow of a great rock in a thirsty land. Then the eyes of those who see will no longer be closed, and the ears of those who hear will listen. The mind of the rash will no one understand, and the stammering tongue will be fluent and clear. No longer will the fool be called noble, nor the scoundrel be highly respected. For the fool speaks folly. His mind is busy with evil. He practices ungodliness and spreads error concerning the Lord. The hungry he leaves empty, and from the thirsty he withholds water. The scoundrel's methods are wicked. He makes up evil schemes to destroy the poor with lies, even when the plea of the needy is just. I love this verse. But the noble man makes noble plans, and by noble deeds he stands. See, a king is not just concerned with his nuclear family. He's not concerned just about himself and his 2.5 kids because there's a hurting world that he feels responsible for. And he will channel assistance through his sons and daughters into this world. Your father is a father and he is a king. And he looks at the world through you and moves us into places where we can fulfill his purposes, which are what? To see that the poor get what they need to see that the, those treated unjustly get what they need because there are foolish people who don't feel protected and they have to take advantage of everyone that they see. They withhold things from those to whom things should be given. They hoard because they don't believe that anyone has their back. They don't feel loved. And what he would do through his children is not just catalyze a sense of I love you but a sense of, go, I have noble things for you to do. Don't just stay tugging on, we don't stay tugging on God's, wait, well, my pants, but his pants, he has things for us. You know what, you know how you know when a child feels secure? This is what they say. I'm back in, okay, I'll just miss, just a second. When they're in a strange room, a secure child in a strange room, you think that secure child will have to stay by the mother's side or will the secure child be able to explore? Will a secure child have to stay by mom or will a secure child be able to explore? What do you think? Explore or stay? Explore? Absolutely. Because they know, I know that my mom is sensitive, cooperative, available, and accepting. I know she has me. I'm going to look around. I'm going to look around. Here's somebody I can help. That's the way it's supposed to work. We don't have connection with God so that he can keep us in this little isolated place. 
God is noble and a king. And he has noble things for us to do and causes to attend to. It's people to help. We do it a number of different ways. I'm looking around at people. And I know stories of how many in here are helping others. We got a chance to do it as a church. We got a chance to flip some burgers on a Friday night for people in the Pettigrew area. One thing we'll be able to do. You know what else is going to happen? Some of you are going to sign up. Again, it's not just in here. You just don't have to do it at home for it to count. But there's a couple things here that's going to happen. Some people have already signed up. are going to sign up, and they're going to, they're going to sit next to a kid and do Play-Doh with them. God just wants us to be concerned just about ourselves. There's other people. Um, the word noble means voluntary concern for the poor and the oppressed. That's what noble means. Voluntary concern for the poor and oppressed. Here's what nobility is. It's a person who is in need. And just for a number of reasons. And for it to be noble, it's got to be voluntary concern, uncoerced. Hey, can I help? If it's like this, if it's, okay, I'll go. (sighs) Okay. That's not noble. It's got to be voluntary, uncoerced, has to be for it to count. And that's what God wants to create, nobility in us. Um, That's what God influences us to do. Voluntary is like a shelter from the wind, a refuge from the storm, a stream of water in the desert, and the shadow of a rock within a weary land. All those images are images of somebody coming alongside somebody else who's in bad straits, being water, shelter for them. God influences us to advocate for the oppressed. The fool preys upon the weak and the the child of God does does what they can to relieve suffering. A couple things, considerations, and we're going to draw this to a close. Hearing his message leads to becoming noble. What it says is the eyes of those who see will no longer be closed. The ears of those who hear will listen. The mind of the rash will know and understand and the stammering tongue will be fluent and clear. What does God tell you? What's his message? It says we'll understand the message. That's what it says here. And understanding the message leads to being noble. So here's my question. What's his message? Here's what we know. The Spirit brings us a message. What message does the Spirit bring? You know, there's some who think the the message the Spirit brings is stop sinning. That's what the Spirit says. When you're going to do something wrong, the Spirit says, stop! That's That's not the message the Spirit brings. We talked about the message the Spirit brings. What is it? What does the Spirit testify within you of? You're a son or a daughter. You know what the Spirit says to you? He doesn't say stop sinning. He says start sunning. Start sunning and daughtering. Start to relate to him as he would have you relate to him. That's why he sent Jesus. That's why he sends his spirit. Start sunning. And you know what ends up happening if you start sunning? Understand you're loved, reaching out and loving other people. You know what happens in the byproduct? You move away from sinning when you move towards sunning. Some of us we do this. We look at sinning and we try to retrace from sinning, but here's our focus. Oh, I got to not sin. I got to not sin. You know what? There are a bunch of really moral people who are absolutely useless in the world. Sure, they never do anything wrong, but they never do anything right. Everything exists for them to look polished and pure. God has bigger fish to fry. He loves you anyways. And he wants us to roll up our sleeves and know we're loved and love others in his name. And some of the people who do that don't always look real pretty. I think God takes useful over pretty. Empathy is a product of secure connection. You know what a noble offering is? There's two kinds of offerings in the Bible, and I am closing with this. I could go on and on and on and on. I know, Mike, I know you could go on and on. My juice gets going with this kind of stuff. I just... Two kinds of offerings. There's a sin offering and a free will offering. Here's the difference. Sin offering had to be perfect. 
Had to be a perfect animal. The free will offering didn't. Didn't have to be a perfect animal. The sin offering comes first. If you do the sin offering, then the free will offering comes. The perfect thing is sacrificed. Then you can give God something that isn't perfect. You know what I think gets people mixed up? They never stop. They never understand that the sin offering has been done. If you're still stuck in the sin offering stage, you can't do the free will offering because the free will offering starts when that stops. Can I tell you something? Jesus died for your sins. Maybe it's time that your focus turns from, I better not sin, to I better start loving people. Maybe it's time for you to start to believe what God says to you. I know what you think. I know your habits. I know your thoughts. And I sent my son knowing all those things. What God wants you to believe? I want you to believe that you're my son and daughter. What would happen if you would believe that? You know what would happen? You'd be less concerned with not sinning. Now again, I'm not saying sin, you understand? But there's more to life than not sinning. If you, got, if you knew that the sin offering was taken care of, you're part of the family. Explore. He's not going anywhere. He's not going to turn his back on you. He'll never not be cooperative. He'll never not be accepting or available or sensitive. He is a wonderful parent. Explore. What has he given you to serve people with? Roll up your sleeves. There's noble things to be done. The noble man makes noble plans, rolls up his sleeves and feeds those who need to be fed, serves those who need to be served. The noble man makes noble plans. Worship team, come on up. And by noble deeds he stands. Out of this whole thing, what is God's love like? It's realistic. God's love is utterly realistic, based at every point on prior knowledge of the worst about you, so no discovery now can disillusion him about you in the way you're disillusioned about yourself and quench his determination to bless you. And it's relational. God is to you fatherly and kingly. I want to pray for us. A um, couple things. If uh, that children's opportunity, there's a sign up back there. Also, there's a transformation need we're going to have to tear up and bring out because, again, we're going to be out of here in a couple weeks. If you're able to do that, maybe once a month, it, that would be very helpful. Hold things, lug things, change things over in a place that we can meet. Uh, you could, there's some information, a couple of people to contact. You can come up and see me afterwards. Uh, good. Let me pray for us. Father, I want to thank you for uh, the, the way you do stuff. Again, love for you is, it flows. It doesn't mean you're nice. You are fatherly, but you're kingly. You, good means that which helps us to know you love us and that which enables us to be useful to you. Both things are part of the deal. It's, I'm glad that you're noble, and I'm glad that you're kingly, but I'm glad you're fatherly. You are good combination. Would you teach us about your love and uh, help us to see ourselves within the focus of your love, even as we do say and think things that are not things we'd like to do, say, or think. It doesn't turn off your love. And I get apparently, biblically, when we understand that, it helps us to be the people you want us to be. It's really challenging God, though. Our spirits naturally cower at you. Would you help us to understand your spirit's message to us, that he testifies with us that, that we're your children, you're our father. Help us to believe it. Uh, for Jesus' sake. Amen.